So me again, sorry. Uh, so um, I'm going to start by by explaining who we are. So uh, we've sort of been mentioned a number of times, uh, and after this morning, I quite deliberately didn't really go into the details. I didn't want to repeat what I was going to say here. Um, but a number of people said, but I still don't understand what you do. So I'm going to explain who we are and then explain more about what the experiments that we're doing with uh, peer review uh, and how those are going. So um, Faculty of a Thousand uh, it started about 10, just over 10 years ago now. Um, and we're founded by a serial entrepreneur called Vitek Chaj. Uh, who founded the Current Opinion Journals, he founded uh, First Open Access Publisher, Biomed Central, uh, before it got sold to Springer, uh, and actually Faculty of a Thousand is a spin-out, uh, essentially, from uh, Biomed Central originally. And the core service of F1000 that we're uh, sort of traditionally best known for is a recommendation service. So we have a faculty of actually about 10,000 experts across biology and medicine, and what they do is they read as they read the literature as part of their work, they identify those articles that are particularly interesting and exciting, uh, irrespective of where, of where that article is published. And that's the really key thing, is the majority of what they pick up are not in what you'd think of as the top tier journals. So it's a, like an article level metric, essentially. More recently, we've moved back into sort of open access publishing. Um, so we launched F1000 Posters, which is an open access repository. It's, it's like a type of preprint uh, for life sciences. Um, but focusing more on posters and slides and conferences. Um, we have about 4,500 of those uh, in the last, been going about two and a half years. Uh, so it's building quite nicely. And then F1000 Research, which is an open access journal, which is trying to tackle a whole set of issues in publishing um, that, uh, so open access tackled obviously some of the accessibility issues and so this is to tackle some of the other issues uh, related to that. Um, so, uh, some of what I was originally going to say was obviously about uh, the challenges of, of, of the problems of peer review, so I'll race with some of those because they've been mentioned already. But this is essentially the traditional uh, peer review process. Um, article submitted, it goes into a closed refereeing process, the author revises the article, this may go round a couple of times. Uh, or the, art the or journal may not accept the article, it then goes to the next journal. The author has to meet their author guidelines, uh, which are often quite different. Um, resubmit it, go around the same process again, new referees looking at it again. Uh, and this can go around several times before it finally gets published. And it takes, at minimum, months, and sometimes it even takes years. Uh, what's wrong with it? This, uh, we've talked about this already, but the extensive delays in the publication, uh, the issues about referee bias, of course, the people who are best at refereeing are likely to, to have a potential conflict of interest because they're key in the area, and so there's a, you know, an incentive on them to hold it up or to be overly negative. And actually, even the editor, you know, where you have scientific editors, there's the potential bias again. You have one individual making a call uh, on, on a particular article. And then this whole issue of repeated refereeing of work for different journals. Uh, and the time, I mentioned this already, the time waste of authors restructuring manuscripts of different journals, because every journal has their own little quirks as to how they want uh, articles uh, to be structured. Why is it a problem? Uh, well, the number of, of authors I've spoken to that have said I've had work scooped while my article was sitting within the review process. Um, you also, as a researcher, need to have something for your next funding application to show for what you've been doing with your last grant. Uh, and if it takes, you know, months, years to get that paper out, it's often quite a challenge to make sure you've got it published. Sometimes even the lab members have left, they've gone off, they're doing something else, and the number of papers that actually have been written up and started but just never end up getting completed and finished uh, because of the movement of lab members during this process is um, scarily high. Um, and uh, meanwhile, others still don't get the benefit of actually having access to the research. And in fact, um, yeah, so, so uh, what are the common causes? Delays in review, talked about that. 
Um, delays in revision, particularly where referees are saying, can we do this experiment and just reanalyze it and all the rest of it. Editorial delays, and then the delays relating to resubmission. So there's been a uh, discussion already about what publishers are doing to improve the situation. There's been a whole number of different things. Um, the Cascade systems have already been mentioned and the Newer Science Peer Review Consortium, which unfortunately, because it's cross-publisher, I think, hasn't worked, um, as I understand, as well as it could have and as well as was, was hoped originally. Some places referees can sign their own reports if they choose to, and some referees say they will only re referee if they can sign their report. Uh, there are an increasing number that give you the option uh, to, to have your, uh, the whole referee discussion published once the article is published. Um, obviously, we've talked about you know, PLOS One and, and others increasingly only looking at the scientific validity issues, and we've talked about the e-life uh, process. But there's still a key problem with all of these, which is that even where we're saying if you choose to, to have uh, the uh, referee reports published when you, uh, at the time the article's published, or even if you insist that it's going to be published at the time the article's published, you're still only including it for those that pass the referee process. You're not including it for all the ones that, for whatever reason, maybe biased reason in some instances, um, it wasn't published. And so it still doesn't fully solve those issues. So what are we doing? We're calling it open science publishing because what, uh, what we're doing, I think, fits very well with the sort of ethos around open science. And so we're trying to massively reduce the length of time it takes to get an article out there and published and to reduce this whole delay. And so what we do is that you submit your article to us. We do an internal pre-publication check. So check, you know, check it's science, check it's readable, you know, English is good. <laughs> Uh, check it's not plagiarized, you know, all the typical things, ethical issues, all those sort of things. And then we publish it. And I really do mean publish it. It's not a preprint server. It's published with a DOI, very clearly labeled awaiting peer review. And it immediately goes into formal peer review, just like anywhere else. But it's post publication. And importantly, it is completely open. So exactly who the referee is and exactly what they've said are published and up there. And so the referee has to stand by what they've said. The authors are then encouraged to revise the article. This potentially can go around several loops, though in general it's, it's once, maybe twice. And then if necessary, the referee will, s will go back and say, okay, you've now addressed my concerns, that's fine. As I mentioned this morning, uh, we insist on having the inclusion of all the data behind the articles as well. And there's no restriction of access. So what I mean by that, it's, it's not only open access, and, uh, but it's using the, the CC BY license uh, for the text, and CC0 is default for the data. So I've just put a diagram up there because it's a lot easier to understand it, seeing the diagram. So the article's submitted, pre-refereeing check. The article's published. The data goes into a data repository at the same time. It then goes into this open refereeing process, and at the same time, anybody, any registered user who provides their full name and affiliations, so you can see who they are, you go to Irene's point earlier, um, can provide a comment on there. The authors revise the article, and once it reaches a certain level of positive refereeing, it then gets indexed. So we now have approval with PubMed and Scopus and a number of others uh, at what point that then gets indexed. So the way we do this, uh, the referees uh, provide two things. They, they provide a status uh, so that you can see at a glance. Uh, so it's either approved, which is equivalent to an approved or a minor revision, uh, approved reservations, which is equivalent to a major revision, or not approved, which means this is not scientifically sound. And the great thing, as you can see in the example here, is that there are plenty of times when the referees don't agree. And that's actually what happens in science. Very often, there are very different camps, and they don't agree. But now, as a reader, I can see there's different camps, and they don't all agree, and I can see why they don't agree. And so it's very useful additional information. We also then obviously ask them to provide a referee report to go with that. Uh, and we ask them to declare very publicly that, that, that they you know, have read this, they think they're a suitable person. We do a lot of checks as to who they are. So although the authors uh, will suggest referees, 
Uh, the number of times they suggest people that don't, when you say, you know, you mustn't have collaborated and you mustn't, you know, have worked together the last five years and you know, need to be, you know, senior enough and all the rest of that. And the number of times they suggest people that aren't appropriate. So we do very careful checks and it's um, far more than I think most journals typically do because, of course, it's, you know, it's not as open and as obvious. Um, and we also ask them to declare conflicts of interest publicly. Uh, so they're all open and signed. The focus is on scientific soundness and not on novelty. The other thing we've had to develop, uh, because things are published uh, before they're peer-reviewed, it's very important that when you see a citation, wherever that is, you know whether it's been peer-reviewed and you know what level it is. And so we developed a citation model together with the indexes and um, uh, Crossref and various other people as to how to cite uh, those articles. And so after the article title in the square brackets, you have the version number, you have the referee status, and then there's a little short bitly. That means that wherever that citation is, you click on that bitly, and it will take you straight to the page that shows you what the current referee status is for that article. So here's a, a sample article. Um, I don't have a pointer, but um, so you can see on the right-hand side, this, and this stays with the article as you scroll down, it shows you the referee status. And it shows, for this example, version one, one referee said, I think it's fine. One said, I've got some concerns. The little two underneath, there was a discussion between the referees and authors, public discussion. Then the authors provided a version two, and now the referees come back with a report and said, okay, I think it's fine. And you can see exactly who the referees are at a glance. You can see on the left-hand side, you know, it points out that it's version two. You've got updated. You've got version two of two. You can go to version one. It may be you cited version one before this happened. That will take you to version one because they each have their own related DOIs. But a message will come up and say, just be aware, there is a version two. And we also use the Crossmark tool, which is incredibly valuable for this kind of thing, where wherever your PDF is, maybe you've stuck it in Mendeley, you can click on that, and it will tell you there's a new version, uh, and this is where it is. And then the, ref the reviews are openly available, and they are updated in the PDF in real time. So the minute it goes on the, the HTML, it immediately goes up onto the PDF as well. So it means the article contains all the referee comments, all the discussion, uh, and any, any other uh, registered user comments as well. And you can see the competing interests, the, the line uh, of uh, clarification there as well from the referee. The other thing that our model allows you to do, because everything is post-publication, and there technically is no end to the article, I think in reality, the vast majority of the articles, you know, it finishes fairly quickly. It means that articles can be alive, and it allows you to do a lot of things um, that you can't normally do, uh, and it allows uh, you to, to uh, link, it better reflects the way that science is, is done. Um, so articles can be updated, say, on a regular basis. So we have a number of articles that have been submitted to us that are going to update every year. So there may be review articles or opinion articles. Uh, we have genome annotation where they've annotated a genome, and in a year's time, they'll have the new updated data behind it and the, the updated annotation. So there's all sorts of quite interesting things you can do. You can do the same with sort of disease models and the data behind it, systematic reviews, all sorts of things like that. Uh, you, we, as I explained, we have versioning DOIs, which makes it very clear what you're linking to. And obviously, the referees can update their reviews. You can even get new additional referees uh, onto it. And also, because of the speed of the process, you can even publish your protocol, get some quick feedback on it, make sure that, that you know, particularly if it's a large study, uh, before you go to all the effort of doing the article, of doing the, the research, I should say, um, you can get feedback on that protocol. <coughs> And we also publish a much broader range of article types. So we strongly encourage negative and null findings, replication findings, whether you succeeded or not in replicating an article or a part of an article. It's actually incredibly valuable. Uh, small studies, data-only articles, all sorts of things. There's some general information in terms of speed. Uh, so we've just we've, we launched in January, so we've only uh, uh, recently started publishing. So we've just done some initial sort of uh, examination of the first uh, set of articles. Um, but our average time from, from our submission of the final article to publication, average time is seven days. And actually, 40% of them are under four days. It's very, very fast. And our average time publication to two peer reviews is about 14 days. 
So although it's open peer review, uh, we're actually not finding it that difficult to get referees, which uh, a lot of people have commented. Um, and we're, not f we're finding referees are quite happy to put negative reports up there as well, only they're a lot more constructive than you often find when it's uh, behind closed doors. We have a very large expert uh, advisory panel and editorial board. I just pulled out a few names so you know all of these. There's a number from uh, Oxford. There's quite a lot, actually, uh, from Oxford. David Shosson, who's in the audience here as well, uh, who's on, on the board. Um, and as I mentioned, we use the, the most open licenses by default uh, to enable text mining. So in summary, I mean, peer review absolutely plays a very important role in providing expert feedback uh, on new research, but the way that it's being used at the moment isn't really working. Most things, ultimately, there's been studies that show most articles will get published in a peer-reviewed journal if the author is, uh, pushes hard enough and goes down enough journals. It's not working at stopping articles getting published. Open peer review, I would argue, really does work. Uh, the reviewers have to stand by their comments they, have to, they tend to be much more constructive about what they say. Uh, and it also opens up the opportunity to provide much more open credit. Uh, so quite often we encourage uh, referees to have co-referees. And in reality, a lot of people get their postdoc to do the initial peer review uh, as a way of training them to critically assess articles. And that's a good thing. Uh, but it means they can get formal recognition from it as co-referees on the referee report. Uh, and I would argue that, that having complete transparency it doesn't solve everything, uh, but it's, it does solve a number of issues and it does significantly speed up the sharing of science. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>